running parallel to the western coast of the Indian Peninsula, the Western Huts are a 180,000 square kilometer chain of towering mountains, winding rivers, open grassland, and dense forest. The huts are one of the most biodiverse places in the world. Here an intricate relationship between land, human and animal has existed for centuries. But competition for resources is on the rise fueled by exponential growth of population in the region which has led to the destruction of several important habitats upsetting the delicate ecological balance that has existed for millennia. I'm David Kampfner, former master's student at the University Centre of the West Fjords in Iceland and I've come to meet the Goa Foundation, an impressive NGO fighting against the destruction of this unique ecosystem. I wanted to find out more about their fight against political corruption in India's smallest state and their remarkable campaign to shut down illegal iron ore mining. So I've come to Banjim, the capital of Goa, to meet Raul Basu from the Goa Foundation at the Directorate of Mines and Geology. He's going to tell us more about mining in Goa. Hi Raul, nice Hi, to meet David. you. Hi good to meet you. Let's How go you and doing? get a cup of tea. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. Okay. If you can just explain to me again the issue about uh, license and unlicensed mining uh, in Goa. The politicians want to give the leases back to the people who are mining and were found to have been illegally mining after 2007. And there's no legal way for them really to do it because our argument is that minerals are wealth of the people of the state and illegal mining is basically theft of the wealth and we cannot have somebody who's stolen public wealth manage public wealth again. So that's a real contest that's going on. So in fact you put them in a very difficult situation which was your intention which is that it would be very difficult politically for them to grant a license to the very miners who were mining illegally previously. Well, I mean, this is just a, a logical sort of analysis of the situation. You know, we are not making the law and we're going to try and get them to do the right. So this, this comes back to your very interesting theory of intergenerational wealth and the idea that the mining companies should not be uh, profiting entirely from the value of the minerals that they extract, but they should essentially be contractors on behalf of the state, right? Is that is that a fair yeah. assessment? Yeah, I mean, our point is minerals are inherited well, and in turn, the miner is who? The miner is basically an outside service, pro an outsource service provider, and we should treat them as such. Take out the minerals on our behalf, give it to them, give it, give them to us, and we'll sell them. There's no great, I mean, the two skills are quite different. So they would get paid a fee for operating the mine, but the, 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 the value of the resources that they extract belong to belong to the state. Yeah. So in, a, in many ways this is like UBI, this is a universal basic income idea and that everybody gets to benefit from it. It isn't just uh, harvested by the biggest players and the, 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 the wealthiest operators, but everyone within, yeah. no, absolutely. Uh, within the state gets to benefit. In many ways a sovereign wealth fund. Yeah, it's a combination of UBI and Sovereign Wealth Fund and it's really not such a new idea. The history goes back to Thomas Paine, uh, James Mead, a famous Nobel Prize winning British economist, suggested something which he called Agathotopia uh, in the context of you know, the dissolution of Russia and what the, you know, the ex-Soviet countries, the ex-communist countries should do. And he suggested something quite similar to this, create a national wealth fund from the income of their fund payout to dividend. In many ways there is a parallel I guess you could say with how little the, the, the average Russian let's say has benefited from the extraction of oil and gas and not exactly an analogy with, yeah. with, with, with Indian um, iron mean, ore but there is a parallel. Yeah and there is equivalently a parallel in the West I mean how much is 
the people of the UK or the people in the US actually benefit from the wealth, from the mineral wealth, probably yeah. not a lot. Yeah. And our argument is that what we're doing is selling inherited wealth. And if you call it windfall revenue, you're likely to just consume it and yeah. therefore children get nothing. So it's important from an accounting standpoint to be able to say it's not revenue or income, but it's actually the sale of wealth. If we do that, then politicians would find it much harder to argue for selling our wealth because then everybody's going to ask, why are we selling our wealth? You know, are we so poor today that we have no other way to fund whatever we're doing? Is this the right time? Is this the right price? Are we going to save everything for our children? The questions we ask become different. Great. Thank you, Raul. That's fascinating. <laughs> Let me have a cup of tea. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. So I'm here with Bertrand. And we're at an iron ore mine in Shigao. It's a place called Shigao. Outside of mm -hmm. uh, Margao in southern Goa. It's part of the issue of open cast mining here, the catastrophic conservation issues that it represents. But you can see the scale of the operation is huge. And so most of this ore will be shipped and out from Vasco, from the port. It's taken by truck from here to barges just down the road, and that should be. It should go back as well. Right, so that should all be re landscaped eventually, yeah. but and it's then... not necessarily going to happen. So, we've come a little bit further down the road from the quarry where we were a second ago, and uh, I wanted to show you a new rail line that's being uh, put in next to the existing one. They're doubling the railway line in order to bring coal from the port of Vasco in uh, South Goa to a new iron smelting plant built by Tata further up the line in Connecticut. And um, you can just about hear this big trundling coal freight train making its way towards us. And as it does so, I'm just gonna show you around because this is the bridge that's been constructed over that railway line as part of this huge infrastructure project and one of the trucks making its way from the uh, quarry, having emptied its load on its way back to collect another, and the crane that is finishing the completion of this road bridge. So you can see everywhere this red dust that covers the road surface, covers the leaves of the trees, covers the forest, also covers the lungs of the children whose asthma complaints are well documented in health reports. And you can understand how much of this issue is both environmentally and economically so sensitive and interconnected. Coal from Australia going to Connecticut to smelt the iron. It's really quite a story. So as the freight train makes its way under this new road bridge, back towards the port of Vasco with its empty coal trucks, you can see how the economic impact is really hard to argue against for the locals here who depend on construction and the quarrying businesses for their livelihoods. And yet this red dust all around us has this massive environmental impact, this huge detrimental effect on the biodiversity of the area, uh, covering all of the surfaces around me. But that's the issue that this part of the world has to deal with as another truck makes its way back towards the quarry to reload. So you can see this, this red dust is everywhere. It's in the water table, it's in the ground, it's absolutely covering all the surfaces around me. So this just gives you an idea of some of the equipment that they use in this vast complex. Uh, we've just arrived at the end of the shift so the conveyors have just been switched off but you get some sense of the scale of this operation and this obviously is just the processing end of the ore that is run up these conveyors and then shipped by truck down to the river barges that take it out from the port of Vasco in bulk carriers normally to China. So, veteran, you were telling me that uh, your uncle worked at the mine 
and that it used to be a much busier place, but since this um, Supreme Court decision about illegal mining, partly sponsored by the Goa Foundation, and uh, the move to bring this kind of open cast, unregulated mining to some sort of accountability, a lot of the activity is actually closed. So it's had a negative impact on the income of the people around here, but hopefully it will also lead to greater control of, of the environmental impact. Yeah. Anyway, we're off to see another part of the mine. So a very different part of the mining operation. This is stone mining for the construction industry. So veteran, you just showed us the, uh, the, the quarry where they're uh, extracting stone for construction and you were saying that that is 100% illegal. That's not licensed in any shape or form. Um, and that the owner of the land will have just made an agreement on a, on yeah. a piecemeal basis with uh, whoever's extracting that stone um, and that when it's finished they will simply walk away from it, right? No. There won't, no, there won't be any landscaping. No, or, no. And those guys working there, they have very little protective equipment. So they have modified the tractor and they have put a blade. So that's, so pro that that's, cut it that's progress. That's progress. Rather than pickaxes and, and yeah. shovels. Yeah. So because of the demand, you know, the construction demand, the construction is booming now in Goa. And, and they basically, they'll just take that stone, move it to a construction site, yeah. and then the other side of that story is also the illegal sand mining that you were telling me about. Um, and um, none of that is regulated and it will be done without any kind of environmental impact assessment of any shape or form. So. And he's just told me something very profound. So what was it again? Die empty. Die empty. Yeah, because you can't take anything to your grave. You can't take anything to your grave, yeah. so die so empty. Disappoint your grave. <laughs> disappoint your grave. And then the other thing was, what's the most dangerous letter in the alphabet? Oh, the most dangerous letter is the letter I. When you say I, 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 my car, my house, my property, my kids, you become sick because I stands for illness. How good is that? You become sick, you get ill and you make others ill. I stands for illness. Yeah, and when you say we, when you say we, my friends, like our, our we as a community, you become well. And how do you spell wellness? Starts from B. W E L L N E S S is wellness. You heard it here from <laughs> Guru Bertrand. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, we've come to the Flora Bar in Kucharan, and the Bertrand's introduced me to Johnson Star Barman, who's produced this in the name of student research. This is Urak. Made of cashew fruit. Cashew. This is made from the fruit of the cashew, uh, otherwise known as the cashew apple. Cashew apple. And it's only really grown over three months. This is the first distillation. And uh, here we have the second distillation. Cashew fenny, which is a much warmer and stronger drink. It's a, it has a beautiful flavor. It's very mellow. It's 42%. And in the case of the long drink, we've got Burak. In Burak, we have Soda Lime, and Chili. Chili. That's beautiful. Cheers. You do, I would give you some. Uh, Ede, Ede, Dega. Another local drink I'll give you of Palm Fiddy. Ita Soda? Okay. That's small shots. You try that another one, which is uh, of coconut palm fini. I'll give you the taste of it. Just have a sip. It's, only the, it's like you are a nice connoisseur, so you can just tell your new penny how you feel the drink. Let's do it. It's going to wash out some of that iron ore dust that we've been breathing ah, that's all day. True, that's, true, that's, true. that's the reason we used to have all those things here. <laughs> 